Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm Mike Thompson. I'm the congressman from this area, and I'm also the chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force in the United States Congress. And this is Gun Violence Pre Prevention Awareness Month, the month of June. And during this month, we're doing a number of things to heighten people's awareness of this epidemic of gun violence across our great country. Every day, 30 people are killed by someone using a gun. If you add suicides and accidental deaths, that number jumps up to over 100 people every day. This year alone, we've had more mass shootings than we've had days of the year. And the number one cause of death for kids and teenagers, gun violence, and that's shameful. In addition to all that, gun violence costs the United States taxpayers over $560 billion every year. There's things we can do about it, there's things we're trying to do about it, and there's things that we should do about it. This is a pretty bipartisan issue. Every place in the United States except in the U.S. Congress. And that's shameful, and that's something we need to do about uh, as well. But Democrats, when we had the House, we were able to pass legislation that dealt with everything from gun trafficking to uh, red flag laws to raising the age uh, for uh, the purchase of firearms to uh, in expanding background checks. In the House, we passed Regular, we passed a law dealing with assault weapons. We expanded background checks to cover every gun sale in the United States. We passed community violence intervention programs. We've uh, dealt with ghost guns and bump stocks. And now the, there's been a change in Congress, as you know, and the new majority party has a different take on gun violence. Now, don't get me wrong. They've got gun bills. Matter of fact, the last time they were in charge of Congress, they passed legislation that made it legal to sell silencers over the counter. And just this week, just this week, the new majority brought to the floor of the House for a vote, and it passed a bill to make legal short-barreled rifles, something that had been illegal forever because they're dangerous, they're menacing, they're a, a choice weapon for people who want to inflict harm, and they shouldn't be legal. They shouldn't be on the streets. I want to point out that um, I support the Second Amendment, and I'm sure that everybody standing up here with me would tell you the same thing. But supporting the Second Amendment and making our community safer, they're not exclusive. You can do both. We can protect our Second Amendment, and we can pass laws that will keep kids safe in school, keep worshipers safe in places of worship, keep music goers safe, music venues and clubs, keep shoppers safe in malls and, and, and grocery stores. We can do it. We know how to do it, and the American people know that we can do it, and they support it. My big bill to expand background checks is supported by over 90% of the American people. And you can't get 90% support for something without having support from Democrats, Republicans, independents, and everybody in between. And nothing is more clear, nothing shows more clearly that than the poll that was just released by Fox News. Fox News poll says that 87% of the American people support universal background checks. Fox News poll says that 81% of the American people support raising the age to be able to purchase a firearm to 21 years of age. Fox News poll says 80% of the American people want red flag laws. And Fox News says 61% of the American people want to ban assault weapons, 
and semi-automatic firearms, something that even Democrats in Congress uh, don't, uh, don't uh, propose. So the American people are with us. You know it. We know it. The American people want their kids safe. They want to be able to go to school, go to church, go to the store safely and not have to worry about that. And it's important that the American people get a voice and let everybody know how important this is. Now, no one knows how, first of all, let me thank everyone who's standing up here with me. Uh, my colleagues in, in, in public service, they, they, they understand this, and they work every day to make sure our communities uh, are safe. The health care professionals that are here, the gun violence researchers are here, they, they understand this. And sadly, the victims who are here have joined a club that none of us want to join. They understand it. They understand how this tears families and communities apart, and no one wants to go through this. So thank you to all of you for being here. And no one knows this any better than our Attorney General, Attorney General Bonta. Thank you very much for joining us, and I'd like to turn the podium over to you. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. Rob Bonta, California Attorney General. Let me thank Congressmember Thompson for convening us and bringing us together. Thank you for his leadership uh, here in California and nationally, and, and including, in, of course, fighting the good fight in D.C. And I want to just uh, echo his comments of uh, thanks, appreciation, gratefulness for being part of this incredible group here today of uh, champions and leaders and fighters uh, for common sense gun safety. And uh, I'm very proud to be in and from California, uh, where we know uh, what we need to do to keep our community safe. And we've, we've done it. We, we lead the nation when it comes to common sense gun laws. And uh, that has led us to be the state with the uh, strongest gun safety laws in the nation and also one of the lowest firearm mortality rates in the nation. Those things go hand in hand. One is because of the other. It's not an accident or random or happenstance. Uh, our laws that are common sense, our action that we've taken, it saves lives. So this should not be a partisan issue. Uh, it's not about ideology. It's about the facts and the evidence and the science and what those what that says. So while, while we are banning assault weapons, large capacity magazines, have uh, robust background checks and red flag laws here in California. Some on the other side of the aisle are trying to fortify doors and um, give every excuse there is to take no action. When community members, our children, our loved ones are in fear going to everyday places, stores, malls, schools, nightclubs, bars, restaurants, movie theaters, places where we deserve to be and we should be safe and could be if we took common sense steps. The United States leads on so many things. We're proud of that. We know we're the greatest nation uh, in, in the history of this planet. We do not lead when it comes to gun safety. In fact, we lead the race to the bottom. We are unique in the world uh, when it comes to gun deaths. We lead the world in that. And it's because of our lack of, of action, action that, that could be taken. So on uh, Gun Violence Prevention Awareness Month, I want uh, other states and the nation to be aware of California's incredible leadership. Some people have asked, what do we need to do to address this, this gun violence epidemic that is uh, taking root or has taken root throughout our country? And I said, it's simple. Follow the California blueprint. We have the playbook. If every state did what we have done, if the United States at the federal level does what we have done, thousands and thousands of lives would be saved. Would we save every life? That's not the standard. Uh, we would save thousands of lives. We would be safer. Our epidemic uh, would be uh, r smaller and, and, res and, and more um, resolved and under control. And so we need folks to stop making excuses for all the reasons why they don't want to take action and just take the action. It's, it's clear what it is. And, you know, I, I just want to share a personal story. I know there's other personal stories that are going to be shared, and, and we should tell our stories. We should talk about 
uh, the horror and the tragedy and the problems. You, you can't fix the problem until you face the problem. And so we should share it. Here's my story. Um, my, I have a wonderful family of five. I have three wonderful children that are everything to me. And um, my wife, Mia, and I, we met when we were 17 and always wanted to have a family. We're proud that we do. Our oldest and I and my wife share a group text. We, 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 we check in. We talk. Uh, we ask each other questions. Um, we support each other. When she was in high school, our oldest sent a text on the group text. And it said this. Mom, Dad, I'm in lockdown because of an active shooter at school. Then silence. And, you know, I'm 90 miles away in another city at the Capitol. She's in the East Bay where we live. And moments seem like hours. Um, the feeling of anxiety, fear, lack of control, lack of ability to do anything, want, you know, wanting to hear more about what's happening um, took over. Um, my wife and I got on a separate communication and we're talking to each other about what we could do and who we should call and how we can help um, when you know our firstborn child is in lockdown. And she was able to share more and, and over time um, the threat was um, ended. She was safe. Um, and in the end, in, in the end she, 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 she made it, but that is not true of so many others throughout this nation, and it should never be true for any American family. That's not a thing, to have that group text that says that. It shouldn't be a thing. It is, and worse. Um, you know, we're losing people in schools, and we don't have to. So, you know, w when you see what uh, Congress Member Thompson just talked about, the essentially the entire nation, across the aisle, urban and rural, coastal and inland, red and blue states, they all know what we should be doing. The only people that don't know or, or know but still refuse to act are, are, are the, the leaders in Congress who are not acting. The, the, the ability to make the most ridiculous excuses for the refusal to act is actually incredible. It, it, it shows enormous imagination and creativity, but it fails to do what we should be doing. Politics is about making people's lives better, um, not making them worse, not making them uh, more unsafe. And uh, I appreciate the leadership that's come out of California time and time again. I think now is a day where we can highlight proudly the great work that we've done in California. And it's come because of leaders coming together from across our, our different levels of government, federal and state and county and city. And most importantly, I believe, our, our advocates on the ground, our uh, young people marching for their lives, our moms demanding action, uh, Giffords and Brady saying enough is enough, we need action. And so I thank you for that. You know, that progress is not always linear. Uh, it moves in zigs and zags. Sometimes you take a couple steps forward and some back. We have not yet achieved what we know we can and that we will uh, when it comes to making our, our country safer from gun violence. But if we continue to push, if we continue to fight, if we continue to lock arms, keep folks' eye, eyes on the ball, we know we have the support of the people. Um, and soon we will make sure that our, our democratic voices in government uh, represent the will of the people. So we'll keep fighting, and until then, we'll, we'll raise awareness and, and continue to call for what we need, uh, which is action. Thank you. And now it's um, my honor to introduce yeah, my, my former, uh, recently former colleague in the California State Assembly, a, a great leader and a great friend, Assemblymember Cecilia Aguiar Curry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Assemblymember Cecilia Aguiar-Curry, and it's an honor for me to stand here with my, all my friends, particularly my colleague, Congressman Mike Thompson, as well as many others that are here from Yellow County. No more excuses. No more excuses. Gun violence in America is an epidemic that needs to stop. You know, we're all tired of saying our thoughts and prayers. We need action. No more excuses. In California, we are determined to move the needle closer to ending gun violence. This year, the State Legislative Gun Violence Prevention work, a Working Group proposed 20 bills, 15 are which are still moving through the process to the governor's desk. One bill I'd like to highlight is AB 28 by Assemblymember Jesse Gabriel, which I have co-authored. 
AB 28 will tax the sale of new firearms and ammunition to fund evidence-based gun violence prevention programs, education, school safety, and research. Part of the funding will go to the California Violence Intervention Prevention Grant Program, also known as CalVIP. This program provides funding for cities and community-based organizations to help reduce violence. For example, the program supports hospital-based violence intervention programs that help interrupt the, cy the cycle of violence. CalVIP has been the most cost-effective and effective community-based violence prevention program in California. But guess what? There's a lot more to do. We need every single tool, tool in our toolbox to prevent mass shootings. Additionally, knowing guns are as mobile as people, we can and must support other state legislators who want to see the change in their own states. Last month, my colleagues and I hosted Tennessee State Legislator Justin Jones, who was expelled by a partisan vote of the Tennessee House for demanding gun reform in the wake of yet another tragic shooting of more teachers and more children in another school in the setting of Nashville. <coughs> My daughter lived blocks away from them. My daughter has PTSD. She knew some of the families that had hit. It's been a really trauma, as you can imagine, is when you get the phone call when you're over at the Capitol and it's your daughter crying and I see the news, uh, uh, the news telling about the shooting. We will continue to reach out and to welcome and support like-minded colleagues across the country to share and discuss what we are doing to prevent gun violence in California. As the Vice Chairman of the Legislative Women's Caucus, we have invited the sister senators from um, South Carolina to come join us in August to have discussions of how we work by, with bipartisan legislators. There will be three Republicans, two Democrats, and one Independent. Let's work together. I thank Congressman Mike Thompson for his leadership and dedication to gun violence reform. Mike, I will always have your back on this. If we had more leaders like you, willing to work across party and institutional lines and in true collaboration to fight the societal disease, every community in this country would be safer. No more excuses. Thank you for coming today and thank you all for fighting in your own way. It will take every single one of us. Thank you and I'd like to introduce my good friend, Sacramento Mayor, Daryl Steinberg. Thank you very much, Assemblymember, for your great comments. I also want to thank Congressman Thompson for having the courage uh, to lead and to never give up, to never give up. And the same with my friend, the Attorney General Rob Bonta, uh, who is lending his office and his voice to saying exactly what Cecilia said a moment ago, uh, no more excuses. You know, I am struck by the one statistic that Congressman Thompson spoke about a moment ago, the fact that 80 to 90 percent of the American public, not just in California, support common sense firearms regulation. And at the same time, the narrow partisan majority in the House of Representatives passed bills to make it easier to proliferate weapons of destruction, and guns that have no reasonable use for hunting or for sport. That's the definition of insanity. In what world could sanity ever be defined as making it legal to put silencers on your guns? In what world could a definition of insanity say that people throughout the country should be able to have rapid-fire assault weapons that have no legitimate purpose? In what world could sanity ever be defined as saying that people who want to own a firearm should have a, a background check, just like we do for people who want the privilege I guess the right to be able to drive 
a motor vehicle. And so this question as the congressman and the state legislature, and even at the local level, as we confront this epidemic, the question I guess that is before us is, is it possible to actually change the culture of this country? The culture which defines sanity in ways that are the complete opposite of what most people, most reasonable people believe. And I think it's important to say to people, especially young people, that you must never give up on this cause because change is possible. The culture will, in fact, change. 30 years ago, when I was a young assembly member, we were divided in the assembly as to whether or not an individual, uh, an LGBTQ member of our society should have hospital visitation rights for the domestic partner. And now we have marriage equality as the law of the land. If that's possible, over the course of years, decades, and a generation, so is common sense gun regulation and ending this culture which glorifies violence and the easy access to guns. So last thing. Some of the red states, this, everything is political. They love to point to California. Oh, you don't want to be like that. And they point to some of our real challenges. And then I see the way California responds to the needs of immigrants and refugees who get deposited in our communities. And I'm really proud of the way we act and react. Same thing with guns. The California model is a model for the nation because it saves lives and it's common sense and it's consistent with the public's view. It's sanity, not insanity. And that's what we need in our nation. And I thank you for gathering us today, Congressman, and insisting that we never give up until more lives are saved. Thank you. Oh, yep. Yeah. It's my honor now to introduce my friend, County Supervisor from the City of Davis, Supervisor Lucas Fredericks. Lucas, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank, thanks, Congressman Thompson, of course, and some of these other fantastic public officials who are being here. I also want to specifically thank the activists, the moms who demand action for gun sense in America are here as well yeah. in full force, and the work that they do every day. Uh, helping us and helping to fight in our communities, local communities, uh, the reduction of the senseless gun violence. Uh, a couple of quick things. I think, obviously, you're sensing a theme here. This is a team effort, uh, whether it's the federal level, the state level, the local level here at the county of Yolo, or even in the cities themselves. You'll hear more from some of my other colleagues in a moment. It's a team effort in everything that we can do to reduce gun violence in this country. Uh, the thing that, and I think it's also really important to note that gun violence affects all of our communities. Uh, this was really crystallized for me actually just a little over four years ago, January 10th, 2019, no more than 200 and maybe 300 feet away from this very location where Officer Natalie, Natalie Corona was gunned down uh, while just performing uh, her, her natural duties as a police officer for the city of Davis. Uh, that moment really was a crystallizing moment, I think, for our community uh, and, frankly, for many around the state and around the country seeing the senseless gun violence and gun death uh, of someone who had so much promise and so much uh, to give the world at age 22. Uh, so again, since this is such a team effort, it's imperative for us, even here at the local level, to be doing work that we can to help and reduce the gun uh, violence epidemic. In Yolo County, one of the things we've done at the Board of Supervisors is to pass a safe gun storage ordinance. That's just one example. <laughs> Uh, of something that we've done. Uh, and it certainly, of course, we all are supportive of the Second Amendment, but state, safe storage of guns is very, very important. Another item that I'm proud to uh, announce is that I, my office, in, in partnership with Yolo County District Attorney Jeff Reisig's office, we are going to be forming the Yolo Gun Violence Prevention Collaborative, which is going to be a, a, a consortium of many groups here throughout Yolo County working on education and policy efforts uh, here throughout our county, but also to help inspire other communities across the state of California to help do their part to redu reduce gun violence epidemic as well. 
I think I'll stop there. Uh, I think it's really important to note that it's so we have folks here, though, with from law enforcement agencies, the healthcare industry, of course, the activists that you heard about as well earlier. We're going to be seeing a lot more uh, from them and hear more from them in the in the moments ahead. But at this point, I'll introduce my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, former colleague on the city council, Davis Mayor Will Arnold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, thank you to Congressman Thompson for uh, for gathering us here today in Davis. Thank you to Attorney General Bonta for for his words and for the work that uh, that these two folks are doing at the state and at the national level uh, to address this ec epidemic of gun violence. Uh, Supervisor Frerichs referenced it. We're here in Davis in Central Park. We are indeed just a few hundred yards away from where Officer Natalie Corona was shot and killed uh, about four and a half years ago, uh, right here on Russell Boulevard in the heart of Davis. Uh, one thing that um, uh, was not mentioned about that night is that the shooter was not just trying to take one life. It, it's only by virtue of his cruddy marksmanship that more lives were not taken. Uh, one of our firefighters took a bullet in the boot. This is a firefighter who was coming to the aid of Officer Corona, trying to save her life. Uh, there was a, a bullet shot into a bus that ended up in a backpack of a student, I understand. This was an attempted mass shooting right here in the middle of Davis. So for anyone who thinks that our community uh, somehow in this bubble of Davis that we live in is immune to this national epidemic, let me break right through that uh, misconception and tell you that it can absolutely happen anywhere. And I truly appreciate uh, particularly Congressman Thompson talking about uh, this issue on a national level and the work that's being done on the floor of the U.S. Congress to address this issue. As the mayor of, a, of the town where we are, I want to take this down to the local level and to the floor of my children's schools as they're telling me, describing to me, I spoke with them today and said, so what happens in one of these lockdown drills? I went to the elementary school that my kids go to now. We didn't have active shooter lockdown drills in the 80s and 90s. So I asked my young children, what do you guys do in these active shooter lockdown drills? Well, they tell us to get on the floor. Uh, we have to get away from the window. The teacher locks the door. And what struck me was the matter-of-fact nature uh, of their description of what is not normal, what school children in other countries do not have to do, which is hide from the specter of somebody coming in with a weapon that could take a whole lot of them down. And we've seen that happen time after time after time throughout our country. And that's what we're fighting for here, is for the freedom of our young children to be able to go to school, to be able to go to parks, to be able to go to uh, uh, gatherings, concerts, music events, movies, but so importantly, to be able to go to school and not consider what happens if somebody wants to shoot them. We, we have a lot of partners here. We're so thankful uh, at the local level to have so many partners at every level. We've heard from our uh, national uh, legislators, our state legislators. We're also so fortunate to have uh, the partnership of law enforcement, including local law enforcement. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, 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 Deputy Chief Henry of the Davis Police Department. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Todd Henry. I'm the Deputy Chief for the Davis Police Department. Um, I also want to thank Representative Thompson for being a leader, uh, especially bringing all these people together who are leaders in our community uh, to address what you've heard is a crisis. And there's no doubt about it, it is a crisis. After 26 years in law enforcement, I can't tell you how many communities, how many individuals, how many families that I have seen traumatized and affected by gun violence. And there are times where it feels like we are helpless but we're not. As you've heard today, there are things that we can do and we need to do them. 
uh, because for most purposes, this is preventable. I'm going to tell you a story of gun violence. Um, obviously, unfortunately, uh, I've been to a multitude of funerals for peace officers just in this region who have been affected uh, and killed by gun violence. In 2017, a good friend of mine, a colleague, somebody I'd worked with for over 15 years, Deputy Robert French with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, was working patrol in North Sacramento when he responded to a call from other officers who had been assaulted with a firearm uh, by a felony suspect. As he raced to the scene, pulled into the parking lot and got out of his car, he was gunned down, killed by an illegal assault weapon. It was a huge traumatic loss. But that is one story of so many losses that we have all experienced. But it's time for us to take action. And as you've heard, this is not a problem that's going to be solved by a single resource. Just law enforcement itself, we are not the solution to this, but we are part of the solution. To be able to effectively address this issue, it requires an entire community. It requires all of us to be able to take action. I have two young children, school-age children, and the thought that they have to consider going to school and being gunned down is horrific. I don't want my child or any child to ever have to deal with that or to grapple with that potential reality. The fact that they may be more susceptible to gunfire than cancer or a car crash is absolutely horrific. We need to be able to do something and we can do something. But like I said earlier, it is a collaborative effort. I think the important thing to remember is that, as I mentioned earlier, this is for the most part something that is preventable. And as it's been addressed here at the state level, the national level, and the local level, there's a lot of entities that are taking those common sense approaches to being able to mitigate it. And that's really the only way we're going to move forward as a single group focused on a single objective, and that's to eliminate gun violence. That may never be achieved, but if we're working towards that, We'll get close to that. Thank you very much. I think, uh, yep. I'm going to introduce Woodland Mayor Vicki Fernandez. Thank you. I want to thank Congressman Thompson for his leadership, but I want to also acknowledge as uh, Lucas mentioned earlier, the moms that demand action, the students that demand action. It's time for us to demand action as residents of our communities. It's time for us to look out for each other and speak up and march in the streets to make sure that our voices are heard. In D.C., at the Capitol, we should not wake up every morning and hear about an incident in one city or another. I, was a I am a retired teacher. I had to lock my classrooms after Sandy Hook. My kindergartners had to knock to come into my classroom, my safe environment, in order to protect those 20 students or 30 students that I had. I had to lock my door and have them knock to come in because I had that one line of defense to protect them. When we had a drill that I was not trained as a teacher to protect students or carry a gun, but I had to protect my students if someone were to come in and invade our safe environment. So as residents and as citizens of this country, we have a responsibility to stand up and take action and demand action for the safety of our children. We have a right. We have a right to live in, in our communities without fear. We have a right to be able to go to school and know that we're going to be safe. And as parents, we have a right to know that our children are going to come home safely to us. So Woodland has taken some action. We have a group called Advanced Peace who has tried to at least work with individuals who may have a tendency to take action that is violent. We are advocating and investing in our community to hope that we can prevent any more shootings. Woodland has had a rash of violence within our community, 
and we're working to protect our residents, to protect our citizens, that they are not harming each other, and that they find other ways to communicate and resolve the issues that they may have. And gun violence is not the answer. We have to work towards finding other solutions and addressing the needs of our community. So thank you to everyone who has spoken on the behalf of Gun Sense in America. And I want to thank you that this is not the end. And it's okay for us to get into good trouble, as Representative Lewis used to say. We have to speak up and do something. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Garen, and I'm going to apologize. Went to mute. Sorry, I didn't want to. Thank you. And he will be uh, speaking next. Good afternoon, everyone. You, you got it just right. Um, thank you to Congressman Thompson for having us to all of you for showing up. Um, I'm an emergency medicine physician at UC Davis Medical Center, the level one trauma center for this region. I also direct the California Firearm Violence Research Center, which is the first publicly funded center for research on firearm violence in the country. We deal in data where I work, and I would like to tell you a story that arises from the data that has been hinted at already by several of the earlier speakers. In the 1980s, when many of us cut our teeth on this issue, California had higher firearm mortality rates than the national average by quite a bit. But we recognized the problem, and beginning in the late 80s through the, predominantly the, the mid-1990s, we undertook a series of evidence-based reforms, all of them intended to drive the rate of firearm violence down. What happened next is that the rate of firearm violence, mortality from firearm violence, plummeted in California, such that by the turn of the century, it was substantially lower in California than it was in the rest of the country on average. But the good news didn't stop there. For most of the last 23 years, the rate of death from firearm violence in California has been trending downward, while it's been trending upward on average in the other 49 states. The result of which is that in 2021, the data were just released, in 2021, the rate of firearm violence in the rest of the nation on average was 71% higher than it is in California, or was in 2021. And let me quantify that. If the rest of the United States in 2021 had had California's death rate from firearm violence and not the death rate it actually had, more than 18,000 people would not have died in that one year. More than 18,000 people alive still today. More than 18,000 families not grieving. More than the children of many of those 18,000 people not crying because mom or dad is not going, coming home tonight. More than 3,000 of those people in just two states, Texas and Florida, which might want to take another look at their current approach to gun violence. Um, I echo what several other people have said in saying that what California is doing is working. Is it enough? Of course not. Is it a model for the rest of the country? You bet it is. And I would like to introduce the next speaker, fellow physician, Dr. Zia de Cansada. Thank you, Dr. Windmill. Thank you, Congressman. My name is Zia de Cansada. I'm one of the trauma surgeons here in of Roseville. Well, not here in of Roseville, but in Roseville. Um, I've been here for 10 years. I'm here to share with you my experience as a trauma surgeon, as an Army trauma surgeon. So. I was part of the forward surgical team deployed in Afghanistan in 2011, where I served as a surgeon and took care of um, combat wounded, including civilians, uh, children, and of course soldiers. And unfortunately, I had the occasion to take care of folks with the same kind of weapons that are being used today in the streets of our country. So. A lot of these high-power high, high weapons are being used uh, are designed to kill. They're weapons that have extremely high velocity coming out of the muzzle. The bullets tumble and rotate. The purpose is to cause cavitation inside the flesh. They're designed to do maximal injury. They're designed to kill 
they're designed for war. Unfortunately, here we are, 10 years later, I'm back here in the streets of California, and at times we see these injuries, not only in the adults, but also in the children, in the bodies of flesh of children. In 2012, after Sandy Hook mass shooting, some 26 people were massacred in cold blood. 20 second graders. After that, a uh, national movement was born um, by the name of Stop the Bleed. Stop the Bleed was a movement that was pioneered by American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. And it's basically a national, it's a grassroots movement where bystanders, much like you, can be taught how to stop bleeding from these devastating wounds until help arrives, right? A couple of years ago, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the school with my children at the time and, and show middle schoolers and um, elementary school kids ranging in age from 7 to 14, 15 years of age and teach them how to shove socks into the wounds to stop the bleeding, to teach them how to make makeshift tourniquets from shirts, from belts, whatever they could find around them, to stop the bleeding from extremity of what could be their buddy, could be their teacher, where these kids learn how to hide under a desk, not to shelter from an earthquake, but from an active shooter outside the door. It's infuriating if you think about it. As father of two teenagers who love to hang out with their friends, go to um, malls and coffee shops and hang out, when you, when you see on the TV screen yet again another mass shooting, that's unacceptable. So as a father, as a surgeon, as an army surgeon, as a citizen, to me, is unacceptable, this culture of violence. That's why I'm thankful to Congressman Thompson, all the political leaders, you all, for trying to be part of the solution to this culture of violence. Thank you. I'd like to invite Azel Humphrey to come next. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Azel Humphrey Grant. I work with Movement for Life, which is a community-based organization in Sacramento that uh, deals with gun violence, um, working directly with the people most likely to become suspects or victims. Um, so I'm boots on the ground directly with the people that are causing trauma at times. And I have to get in the space to get them to change their lives and get them to reimagine public safety, public safety for their futures. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, I keep looking over my shoulder, I'm sure nobody's really paying attention to me, but uh, I have my three youngest children back here. They go everywhere with me nowadays. Um, and I, I worry about them all the time, dealing with gun safety. You know, even though I came from some hard streets myself, I changed my life and I'm, I'm directly in the path of the people trying to make a change. I stand with Moms Demand Action, uh, like I told um, Mr. Uh, Assemblyman Thompson. When they call, I go. Um, it, they have a movement put together, you know, and they bring things like this together. Uh, and they, they add us into it, and it's, it's very important that we are a part of it um, because we're at the center dealing with the people in the communities that struggle with these issues uh, personally. But I want to tell you a little bit about why we're actually here. Um, I'm with Movement for Life, and um, after experiencing overnight success in the city of Sacramento with our partnership with the city of Sacramento, law enforcement and elected officials, he, we had to overcome the challenges and adversity of being a city that is divided. We are divided at the expense of our children. I've watched us work together despite our differences and achieve monumental success for the benefit of our children and are reimagining public safety as a whole. 
However, on the flip side, more recently, I've watched us not prioritize our children and young adults. I've watched us pull the plug on successful programs in the space of gun violence prevention and intervention. I'm aware of the Sacramento Kids First Pass uh, Fund passed, but that's yet to be put into practice. So I make the appeal to unite the city, unite all the cities and around this issue. Um, it's being done across the country, except here. Our inability to unite is costing people their lives and our communities aren't safe environments to raise our children. Respect the leaders like Chet Hewitt and our elected officials who are willing to have an open mind about alternatives to policing. We appreciate law enforcement. I have brothers in arms. They are real good people. But we can't simply police our way out of this. Um, we need adequate, sustainable funding for the CBOs and direct conflict of interest for that funding to be controlled. What we don't need it to be controlled by law enforcement. We need to be able to let the community organizations do their job and let law enforcement do their job. We're all needed. It has to be together. And that, on that note, I would like to introduce my sister, Mary Duplay, for Mom's Demand Action. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I am a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Moms Demand Action is a national grassroots organization. We are mothers and others, gun owners and non-gun owners alike, working alongside community partners and lawmakers at the local state and federal levels to enact common sense gun violence prevention laws. Not only am I a volunteer with Moms Demand Action, I am also an Everytown Survivor Network Fellow and a gun violence survivor. My daughter, Lorna Clark, went away to college and never came home. Lorna was a beautiful, talented young woman, an artist, actress, dancer. And the year before her death, she was accepted into the first California State Summer School for the Arts, a prestigious summer school. There she was recruited by several colleges. She chose Chico State. It was such an exciting time for her and for her family. She moved to Chico, but she never got to attend a single class. She never got to have a family. She never got to reach for her dreams. Her life was senselessly cut short by a gun. The last time I saw Lorna was when she was testifying before a legislative committee on behalf of the California State Summer School for the Arts at the State Capitol where her artwork was on display. On that day, I got my last hug from my daughter. Lorna and our young people are the reason I stand here today to say enough is enough. This is why I do the work that I do. California leads the nation in the fight against gun violence, yet there is still work to be done. To join me and other mother, excuse me, <laughs> Moms Demand Action volunteers in this fight, text the word READY to 64433. I am grateful and proud to stand with gun violence prevention champions like Congressman Thompson and the many state and local lawmakers and community violence interruption groups he has gathered here today. We are stronger together and together we can end gun violence. I know 
that California can lead the way. Thank you so much. And now it's my honor to introduce our gun violence prevention champion, Representative Mike Thompson. Oh, sorry. Did I skip? Oh, you know what? Jonathan Raven, Yolo County sorry. Chief Deputy District Attorney. Uh, Mary, Mary, may Lorna's memory be a blessing. Thank you very much. Ten years ago, I sat in my office <clears throat> with Gwen Robinson, and Gwen's son, who was 25 at the time, was killed uh, with a firearm in West Sacramento. Um, it was a senseless case where I believe if the killer did not have a firearm in his pickup truck, with his 12-year-old son he was with, this never would have happened. And I told Gwen that although I couldn't bring Gid back, I would do everything within my power to get justice. And when the jury convicted this man and the judge sentenced him to 40 years to life in prison, I felt good. But for Gwen, this could never bring Gid back. And forever she's going to have that hole in her heart. So I want to challenge everyone here. Are you guys up for a challenge? Yes. What I want to do is I want to strive to take the DA's office out of business with respect to firearms cases. Because I don't want to spend my time prosecuting people who have shot their partners in domestic violence cases, gang cases where people have shot and killed each other. You see the suicides that come across our desk sometimes. I want to be proactive and not reactive. And I want to work on the red flag laws and the gun violence restraining orders and the gun buybacks and safety storage. And I'm so pleased we're here today and that Congressman Thompson has brought us all together um, because as Supervisor Frerich said, our office, the DA's office, and Jeff Reisig is my boss, the DA, is partnering with Supervisor Frerichs to start a gun violence awareness collaborative task force with the goal, as I said, of being proactive and not being react reactive to make some changes because we need changes, and it's time that we say enough is enough, as all of us have said here so far. So thank you again for having us. I welcome to Davis, my home. I was really impressed to see this huge event is happening in my backyard. It's so important. And thank you, Congressman Thompson. Well, uh, Thank you all. You, you guys were fantastic. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for what you do uh, every single day. Um, I, I couldn't help when I heard my colleagues talking, and especially the part about their personal story. A lot of things were going through my mind. Uh, I became the chairman of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force right after Sandy Hook. And I can tell you I've met with just about every family and every survivor and many of the victims of gun violence across our country. You name the venue, I've probably met with their families, the victims, local uh, of officials. So I have uh, a lot of those personal stories. <clears throat> I thought about when I heard my Army buddy talk about um, the trauma, uh, I thought about how it took me four months to learn to walk again when I was wounded in Vietnam. And I was one of the lucky guys uh, I came back. But the thing that really got me thinking was all of the comments about our kids in school and our kids having to go through this different training in case there's a, uh, a perpetrator on the school grounds. <clears throat> and what I thought about was the day I got off the airplane at San Francisco uh, Airport from Washington, D.C., and turned my phone on, and it lit up. There was an active shooter at the California Veterans Home in Yachtville, California, just a few miles from my home. 
I think I broke the land speed record getting from SFO to uh, to uh, the veterans' home. And I pulled in, and our sheriff met me. And we got about three steps from my car, and one of the captains with the sheriff's department came up, <clears throat> and he said, your boy's in there, and he's doing great. That's what I thought about when we were talking about the kids hiding in the classroom. My boy is a deputy sheriff. He knows how to handle a firearm. He has all of his life. He's trained in it. And my heart sunk when I heard that. Think about these kids. And when kids tell me, I'm afraid my school's going to be next, <coughs> our parents tell me, I take special attention to what my kids are wearing when I drop them off at school. Because as you know, many of the massacres that have happened at schools, they haven't been able to identify the kids. They've had to take DNA samples. This is disruptive to our entire community. It's hard for kids to learn. And it's, it's just not American. We should not allow this to happen. So thank you. We're happy to take any questions.